Welcome, welcome. Thank you, so much. Uh, thank you for joining us. So thank happy you. to have you. Thank you for inviting me. We should um, introduce ourselves. Yes, definitely. Now that we're all together. Um, I'll start with myself just to get me out of the way. I'm Memphis. <laughs> I'm Memphis, the moderator of the group. I'm a coordinator of uh, Uptown Kitlet program at Word Up. I'm a CCNY college student. I'm from Harlem and I'm very excited. <laughs> I'll pass the mic on uh, to Yvonne because you're the person to the right of me. Yes. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I'm a native New Yorker, fifth generation on one side of my family. Um, I'm an attorney, I do removal defense. I represent people facing deportation. Um, my son's in high school. Um, I'm very interested. I haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but I'm interested in hearing the discussion today and I'm interested in purchasing the book. So I'm happy to be here. <laughs> You know, next on my screen is um, Alice. Yeah. Hi, I'm Alice. Uh, I'm a high school English teacher, so school just ended. Um, and I read your book in two days. Um, and now I'm here. So I'm really excited to hear you speak. Reading, reading that got assigned to you instead of something you assigned. <laughs> right. yeah, exactly. Um, let's see. Uh, Veronica. Hi, I'm Veronica. Um, I'm, I'm work at, I started Word Up Community Bookshop and oh, wow. um, I've lived in, down the street from Word Up for the past 18 years, um, but I'm originally from Toronto, oh, okay. Canada. And <laughs> are, you a, are you a dual citizen? I'm not a dual citizen. I'm a permanent resident at the moment um, and only yeah. have been for the past few years, a couple of years. You must be having some reservation. <laughs> Why yeah. do you do this country right now? Yeah. yeah, I need to do something soon, I think, because my son is a U.S., you know, was born here, and I just, we need, I feel like we need to be the same. Yeah, yeah. Just in case. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Absolutely. working toward that. But yeah, interested in hearing the discussion today. Is it Kathleen or Caitlin? I can't. Hey, it's Kathleen. I'm so glad to meet you. I just started reading your book, um, and today is a big book club book day for me. Um, I'm based in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, and uh, I just came from a discussion about this book called Minor Feeling. Oh, yeah, of course. You know this book? Yeah, so um, I'm mixed race, Japanese American. I'm really interested in the history of Black struggle and how it intersects with Asian American activism. Um, so, I just, yeah, I think it's really important. To yes, my, um, actually, I just read a very interesting thesis uh, by a Japanese graduate student. She is from Japan. Um, and she was quoting minor feelings and talking about all the things that surround her visa and people's responses to it, legal and, you know, conversational. And she was quoting minor feelings, which, you know, they're connected to microaggressions, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. That sounds like a great, I mean, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and let me see. Oh, yes, down. I don't see Deborah and Cassandra and Perla. I see your names, but not your faces. Ah. Hi. I'm Hello. Cassandra. Uh, I'm from New York, and I, I just got the book yesterday from the book club, so I haven't had a chance to read it, but I read the first couple pages, and I love the way um, you write, very insightful, and very condensed, by the way, uh, <laughs> which is very good. I need to learn that skill. <laughs> Thank you. All oh, that journalism. <laughs> um, and let's see, it's Perla, Perla Marte. Hi, my name is Perla, and I'm a high school student, and I'm studying because I want to know about about what it is the book. Yeah. Good to meet you. Um, and there's Deborah. Deborah did say that she might have to lift furniture briefly, but she. <laughs> 
<laughs> We've all been doing stuff like that lately, right? Yes. Getting down and, well, as someone said to me, we clean what we can clean and we ignore the parts that we <laughs> just never quite get clean. Yes. So, um, what would you all like to talk about? What have you, what's been in your head, whether it's to directly connected to my book or to other things, I'm, I'm game. There's yes. plenty going on. We're not wanting for things to talk about, certainly. Um, and the interplay between your book and the things that are happening right now, uh, you know, hard to ignore. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, we, we, there were a couple of, you know, you, you have a section where you delve into um, your sort of interest and exploration of Black feminism and Black women thinkers and artists and writers, and that was something that we had expressed interest in hearing. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, um, I got out of college, so I was in, in 64 to 68. These were these, this is leading to feminism. Um, these were the years in which um, the kind of gentle anti-war movement turned into really um, vehement. Um, anti-Vietnam protest. This, what we called the civil rights, um, you know, Martin Luther King led um, peaceful demonstration in a sense movement turned into black power. And all of this is like between the early 60s and, and late 60s. Um, women were really involved in both the civil rights movement and black women, black, the black power movement, even though Black power was evolving a kind of fake um, African uh, philosophy of the women are supposed to, be, you know, sit quietly while men talk and busy their hands with um, weaving, etc. But that wasn't, you know, you had Angela Davis, for God's sake, you know, you had Kathleen Cleaver, that wasn't entirely what was going on. But in that, also you had women like Ella Baker or Diane Nash, who'd been real leaders in civil rights, in the, in the protests, the sit-ins. Um, and they had, everyone in the movement knew about them, but again, the emphasis was on um, putting, pushing them, the pushing black men forward meant fighting the oppression of black men. This is different now in terms of Black Lives Matter because women are so absolutely you know, at the, at the heart and the center. But there used to be this strange division. It was as if to, to support black rights was to support black manhood. And we were just kind of along as opposed to manhood, womanhood, transhood, etc. So what happens in, um, God, right around 69, 70, um, and I didn't totally, you know, get into it until I was probably, it was starting to happen a little earlier, is um, white feminism and black feminism and, in fact, um, Latinx, we called it Latina feminism, and Asian feminism were starting to emerge. Um, for black women, it was very contentious. Maybe the first anthology, do any of you know this anthology from 70, 71, The Black Woman, edited by Tony K. Bambara? Okay, uh, that was probably, there were little meetings going on, but that was probably the first kind of statement, you know, widely disseminated of, um, of black feminism. And, we felt, I was in New York, I'd, I'd moved to New York in 69, um, and women of every group, we were tended to be segregated, but every group of women who wanted, who cared about feminism and leftist politics, all that, we were finding each other. You know, um, um, some of you may know Michelle Wallace's work. Um, you know, I met Michelle through her mother, Faith Ringgold, the artist, and then we both ended up at um, Newsweek together. And, you know, there were all these alliances. Um, so, and there was the wonderful Flo Kennedy. 
So I consider myself extremely lucky historically. You know, sometimes histories, history is so bad to all of us so often, but sometimes it's good. You're in the right place at the right time. And um, I was in a big city. It was New York. It was happening in other cities, um, but everyone was here. And so somehow between like 69 and the early 70s, black feminism, feminism, white feminism, black feminism, all multicultural feminism exists. Uh, what was then called gay rights, now we say LGBTQI. But initially, it's like, it was like the difference between Negro and black in the, in the days when Negro was favored, and maybe every group has something like this. Black, that was because no one wanted to be called Black. Then we all wanted to be called Black. Um, it was very much the same thing in terms of um, LGBTQ. Gay was a word that got around the insults attached to queer, you know, or oh, homosexual seemed very old fashioned and dated. Um, so all of these movements were like exploding um, at the same time. Now, the other thing that was happening, here's a bookshop, um, like word up. Women's bookstores were, and black bookstores were appearing, not all over the city, but you, they were some in every borough. Um, in the 70s alone, um, Alice Walker and Toni Morrison and Toni Cade Bambara um, all started um, publishing. Nella Larson and Zora Neale Hurston were being reissued for the first time, as were other um, Black women writers. Uh, when did um, when did the Woman Warrior come out? Does anyone know? Maxine Hong Kingston's book. There was this. It, there was this flowing. This 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 birth and rebirth of um, Black and women of color literature. Um, and the canon, you know, um, the things that, um, is it Perla who's a high school student? Um, people now read regularly, Hurston, Sandra Cisneros. Um, none of these books you know, were being read, were being accepted, were being um, presented as valuable literature, bef really before the 70s and 80s, it's so, recent. Um, so, you know, this was, um, this was the making of me as an independent, um, largely free thinking, but, you know, proud to have a self person. Without that, you know, God, I can't conceive of what would have happened to me. Um, I, oh, yeah, I would have led, led a fairly conventional life. And then, as I write in the book at some, at some parts, you know, um, you know, a good, a good, maybe a good wife and mother who cared about literature, and I would have been bitterly angry, and I would have been, I'm sure, downing antidepressants a lot of the time. So, you know, these movements, they, they, they change the country. They save masses of people, but they save individual lives, too. They really do. Unless anyone else had, does anybody else have something they want to say in response? Cassandra? No, it's not Cassandra. It is Alice. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to hear a little bit more about because I did when when the more radical movements happened, were you very excited to embrace them? Given your, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Rather <laughs> conventional background. <laughs> yeah, conservative conventional. Background, uh, yeah, that uh, and then how, like, emotionally, how did you did you see it immediately as this is this is freedom? Um, were you scared? Were you empowered? Like, emotionally, what did you go through? No, did no, you, I to, you think to, the country was moving towards radicalism, like all of that. It's really an important question because it gets so le left out. All the mixed things. I, um, you know, I'll start with what was easiest. It, it was thrilling, you know. Um, I got to college. I'd gone to a fairly, I actually went to a relatively progressive high school. So even in high school, you know, I was getting interested in, you know, folk music and demonstrations and da -da -da -da, but you know, still. But in college, you know, you get, I, I was away from home for the first time. Um, 
and there we all were. And it, 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 I was very excited. I was, that's when I went on my first demonstration. <laughs> they were peaceful, little modest demonstrations, but that's what it was. It, it, it was empowering um, because you, you started joining. For the, the young, the gen, you know, generation gaps are not to be, um, not to be downplayed. They are deeply strengthening. You know, we, I started to feel, we all did. Um, all my friends at different schools, this is where so many of the movements are started. But this is where Students for a Democratic Society started. This in, it was in colleges a few years later that the first black student organizations started and then you know, followed by Native American, you know, um, various. Uh, so you had peers who were your support system and, and it, it overlapped with all the things you want in a social life. You stay up all night, you know, um, um, smoking and talking and you're listening to Aretha Franklin and you're listening to Bob Dylan also, you know, and you're, maybe you're, maybe you're smoking a little grass, maybe you're not, but you know, you're, you, you just veer from the most fun, you know, music, dancing stuff to the most intense discussions. Um, was it scary sometimes? Yeah. Um, did I, sometimes I enjoyed my, I had a sister and she, her politics were basically like mine, though she was three years older. So we were entering this together, which helped. It wasn't always fun to argue with my parents or to start to look down on them in certain ways, not just to critique them, yes, but to also, look, you know, your snobbery is so contented. And, in, and sometimes to, um, sometimes to the little a history that they had honorably earned, but I, you had to do that. You just had to. Um, so I'd say all, all of those things, but you know, you were always making decisions. I remember um, one summer, a friend of mine, a year behind me in college, he wanted to go to a demonstration where we were likely to be, this was in Chicago for the summer, um, it was not going to be a peaceful demonstration. And, and um, you know, the police were likely to get nasty. Um, and I decided I didn't want to go. And, you know, so you, and then I had to live with that. Actually, I'm not sure he went ultimately <laughs> either. But, you know, you had to, you had to make, you made these decisions, you improvised, then you compensated, you know, with another um, more daring um, demonstration. So it was a, it was a very mixed thing. I, you were always finding that your, your, your principles, your temperament, um, your strengths, um, as well as what your weaknesses were, um, your, your ethics, uh, they were always being um, ex tested, but also experimented with. Um, and that was, that was a, that was a good, that was a good thing. Um, you did stupid things sometimes. Um, I remember, well, I don't know if it was stupid, but it was excessively mean. Um, I remember mm. when, when Black Power came and a group of us started our Black student organization, um, I just started a couple of people who'd been not close white friends, but genuine friends for years would speak to me and I would just cut them dead. Um, that was general anger but it was also a, a flexing of power muscles that as a very well-behaved, you are supposed to be the perfect token black person, I had never had, you know, so I get why I needed to do that. But, you know, was it as admirable as going to a black power demonstration? No, but, you know, so there was that, that funny, very intimate and personal acting up and then the, you know, acting out. And then there was the acting up in a good way, you know, that was honorable. Does that, does that give you a sense? Yeah. And I think that that stays with you, um, you know, that, that, that bumpiness, that sense of, oh, what's around the next bend? But you are mapping out um, the routes of who you, of who you want to be what you believe in, what you love, too, and, and the different levels of it, you know? I have a question, and it is to the larger group, um, because you were talking a lot about the role that 
being in a certain social environment, particularly in college, but also, you know, you talk, you speak of high school and, you know, Alice is a high school teacher, thinking about teaching your book or, you know, having your book for her students. And we have, you know, Fairlas here, she's uh, a high school student. I think there's this question of like, you know, like there's this moment where many people are involved, you know, um, in all ages, uh, including high school students, of course, you know, they're staging walkouts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> part of the ethos here um, right now. And I think within the confines of an institution like a high school, where you go there and you go back home at the end of the day, in an urban setting, right? Like, I, you know, I went to a public school in New York and it was a weird environment. We had a black student union that I helped found. I was the president of the Gay Straight Alliance, the, the Gender Sexuality Alliance. Yeah, there we go, right. <laughs> but, um, I think the question, and, and we read all sorts of books and, yeah. and we talked about, you know, our, the canon of the school was something that might be considered progressive, but you, you had to, you had to supplement it. You had to critique it. You had to improve right. it. Yeah. But not even being, like, I think the social environment that we, they fostered was not one that was any way, in any way near comparable to what you're describing your experience in college was. Like, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, around, and so these students have access to all of these same things, but how then the high school or how then the educational institution then facilitates that, I think like, I don't know, I, I'm curious to hear more about what people's thoughts are around that because there's reading the book in class and there's giving the book to the children and then there's facilitating this transformation um, or having space for these transformations to take place within this institution that already exists. You know, you mean the high school, because the other the other institution that already exists that they are Im embedded in is their family. Right. <laughs> well, I'm curious as to what other people think. It's, it's probably you've all been in high school more recently than I have. Um, but that 24 hours a day, even if you're living at home when you go to college, that sense that the center of your life has moved elsewhere. Also, if you're in a city, a college in a city, that also means you've got all that other access. Um, I don't, you know, do, do those of you who, do you all distinguish, those of you who are not in high school anymore, um, do, does that sense of how cliques um, and all those, you know, social and, and sexual anxieties and needs and um, I think, I think that's stronger and more, more punitive and harder on you in high school, at least it, it was for me. I'm, and that's, that can get in the way of what, of the, of the kind of three dimension, you know, multi-dimensional awakening that you're talking about then. But I'm about I don't know. You know, again, when I was in college in the sixties, things were a lot more strict in some ways than I imagine was true for any of the rest of you, even in a so-called progressive environment. So that those are questions you all can answer better than I am. I mean, I want it, I'm curious. Hi. Is, who, is, who is this? This is Cassandra. Oh, hello. <laughs> okay, there you are. Um, I think for me, I think I really learned about all of the isms, I think, after high school. Yeah. Uh, because you have this sense of awakening and you really experience the world as an adult and you get to see, like, oh, okay, like racism, sexism, um, all of the isms actually really do exist. And I think, um, because for me growing up, I grew up in a very strong, like, dominant female uh, household. So mm -hmm. for me, like, sexism didn't exist, right? Because I didn't have that in my everyday. Yeah. But until I started to go out into the real world and try to advocate for myself and do things for myself, then I realized, like, oh, wow, like, you know, they will be people who see me and have certain perceptions about me just because of my race or my gender or mm -hmm. how I look. And I think it's something that it's important because once you evolve your thinking, it's sometimes it's difficult because you still live in those environments. Um, 
like at home, like if your parents or your family doesn't believe the same way you do, it can be very challenging. Um, And sometimes you get very angry. Um, But for me, I think I've learned to just deal with it through love and understanding and like meeting my family. If they disagree with me on something, just meeting them where they're at. Maybe they haven't achieved that, you know, level of consciousness, um, but they will when they do and just bring them along the ride for, you know, um, as much as I educate myself. Let me ask you this. Um, What gives you the strength to do that? I mean, oh, what, I, what are what are your supports when you say, okay, my parents and I just don't we don't agree on this, but I'm living at home. I mean, what what are your sources of of strength and and su- pleasurable support? I think for me, I think because I have so many friends who yeah. think like me, yeah, it's yeah. easy for me to have like a sounding board. You know, like I have people who who see me and who like let me speak and like voice what I feel, and they don't question me. And so when I get questioned by, let's say, my family, it's easier for me to just say, you know what, they don't understand. That's not their shared experiences. But I do have a group of people who will validate me and like let me talk and um, let me know that you know it's all like the things that I'm experiencing are not because of me, they're because of ignorance or uh, the way that the social world is. Um, and it, that gives me strength and power, I think, to just continue on my path, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the friends that you, that one creates, the, 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 the sounding boards, the supports, the, the people you can improvise with, the ones who kind of help inspire you, that's, that's so crucial. Yeah, I think for me, I think my question for you is, um, do you feel growing up in a more, I don't want to say elitist, but more like a, <laughs> um, a professional environment, uh, did you feel pressured to, to live your life uh, a certain way? Did you feel like you had to, to become a professional yourself? Did you feel like boxed in in a way? And like, how did you cope with that? Um, I think, you know, let me... Um, in, in that world, which is very tied to the world of what's now called um, respectability politics, um, um, and it isn't only, uh, I think every minority group has some version of this. You were expected, um, of course, to reflect well on your family. Um, that meant, okay, you were supposed to have good manners, you were supposed to have a good character, you were supposed to do very well in school, you were supposed to, um, if you were a guy, have a good career in a family. If you were a woman, the career was optional, but you certainly were expected to finish college. Um, and, and that pressure also to reproduce um, a kind of typically bourgeois family, which has a long history in, in black, uh, black history, you know, somehow refuting the notion that, uh, you know, black families aren't stable, parent, child, whatever. So there was, in some way, we were all supposed to be exemplifying, proving that black people could, in all the ways that white people valued, we could succeed and excel. Um, that is hardly a pressure, you know, that my generation alone experienced. That has been a culture for black people since, you know, the old distinctions between house Negroes and field Negroes and free free people and enslaved people, you know, those hierarchies, which as just as class hierarchies are lethal enough um, and fixed enough, they become caste hierarchies, but also, they are tied to how, what, what you believe, and often it's true, the white world is going to concede what, their, what, you know, what protections, what laws, what, um, what fairness they are going to extend to you. So that's, that's a lot to take in. Um, then there are the particulars um, of being a woman, um, which as I think you're getting, there's that that doubleness. On one hand, you are supposed to be a successful achieving person. On the other hand, it didn't really terribly matter, even though there's a long lineage of Black women working, founding schools, starting organizations, being artists, being politicians. Um, it, 
didn't entirely come so to be freed um, from that, you know, into some real sense of, um, of, of female and particularly black female um, power to change society, to change yourself. Also, and I don't want to be pious because, you know, I became a writer. Also to fulfill whatever your particular, you know, creative, um, professional dreams are um, and, and longings are. Uh, so, you know, I, I, had, I, I had those of us who wanted some world and some life outside of that um, bourgeoisie, um, you know, we, we had to move outside, outside to find it. I, I, you didn't have to turn your back on everything. You know, I had good relations with my parents till their deaths after some rocky years. But it's no accident that my sister and I, you know, we relocated ourselves to New York. We took advantage of every social, artistic, sexual, political um, opening, change um, there was. I mean, I, I, think every, I think everyone, and maybe particularly girls, we have to look so closely, examine so closely what the legacy of our, of our parents are, our families, their, their histories, their relationship, all of which marks us, and um, what the legacies of the group that they and we belong to, or the groups, if you are biracial um, or multiracial. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then what do you do when you're trans? You know, then you are mm -hmm. forging a, a wildly new path. Thank you for that. Um, this is Cassandra still. Um, I think for me, I'm Latinx. So for me, it's like um, there's very much in a lot of ways good and bad there's a lot of uh, sexism within our culture mm -hmm. and so as a person who is a woman who a professional woman who's very successful in my field I still feel this like um, kind of like paradigm of trying to still be you know the perfect um, Latinx woman which is like cook clean be married um, and have a successful career yeah. and do things that are different from what my parents did, you know, because I'm given this new found opportunity. And it's just a, it, it's a constant inner battle, I think. <laughs> well, you know, there used to be this slogan in the women's movement, you know, we can do it all, we can have it all. That, that, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> so, um, yeah. What, what is it that you want and need, you know, most and feel is, is, is critical. But yeah, we got a lot of paradigms, it's true. And belonging to any kind of minority intensifies the paradigm pressures. Yeah, um, it's Alice. Um. I really like, I'm an English teacher, by the way, uh, in high school. So I really like the section where you were reading James Baldwin and Baldwin said something about little women being too sentimental or overly sentimental. Um, and, I'm, and also there was a heartbreaking line. I don't have it. I had it on e-reader where you talked about something about, I'm going to butcher this, but something about loving a culture, which is white culture. It doesn't and love you back. Right. Yeah. That broke my heart. Um, Right, and just as someone who, like, I was born in China, I'm an immigrant here, um, but I, English is my second language, and, you know, that really spoke to me as well, oh, um, but I'm curious, especially thinking about teaching a stu students in New York City in an interracial, like, community, when did you, when did you embrace, um, I guess it's probably related to the Black Power Movement in the 60s and 70s, when did you embrace literature um, a black literature were you all I think I guess you said in high school you did study some Baldwin but I'm sure it was most canonized it was bought you know we did a little Baldwin a couple of the essays we had done um, I believe that was it now there was a tradition I mean I will give my parents credit for this um, being uh, veterans of that of old movements like Negro History Week and <laughs> society for, you know, um, they've, there's always been, they've usually been segregated, movements to teach 
you know, black literature, black culture. So my parent, my mother especially was aware that that was something I was going to get less of in white schools, which I attended from kindergarten on, than she had, for example, gotten going to um, black schools in Chicago. So she would keep, you know, there was Langston Hughes in the house. There was, you know, but they weren't being taught in school and every child registers the difference. So what, guess, what happened really, it felt, it felt somewhat compensatory, actually. It was college, again, it was um, the first uh, black studies and black literature courses started really being taught in, in the late 60s. And I remember taking one. It was taught, in fact, by, by a white sociology professor. There were no, I was at Brandeis. There were no, at that point, black um, faculty members. And that was very typical of, of many schools. But there we were, at least, reading um, Hughes, reading Wright, reading Ellison. And then you got, one got so excited because, again, there was, there was the movement. So you were, you were going to readings. You were hearing um, Amiri Baraka read. You know, you were hearing um, all manner of people, po poets. I remember in the 70s, I went to some little reading downtown and who did June Jordan introduce but into Saki Shange. And she said, there's this terrific young poet who's just gotten here from California. Now I was out of college by then, but you know, it, again, it was that, it, was, it, it entered the air of the culture that mattered, which is, was not just the book canonical culture of, of schools. It was the moving, you know, visible, culture. It, it, was, it was movies, you know, it was popular music. It was suddenly realizing that it was worth learning what, what Black composers had been composing classical music. Um, and, and, you know, all of that. So, yeah, I would say, again, it was, it was, it was, it was, the, it was the 60s, moving that into the center of the culture, making all of this material that Every, that, you know, somewhat, everyone had a sense they had to know something about, as opposed to, oh, these poor little minority peoples, you know, that's the best they can do. You know, and then it happened with, um, with women across, to some extent, more and more across um, ethnicity and race. Then it happened with queer writers, and then it, you know, it happened with Latinx writers with various Asian, with American Indian. It all started snowballing. Courses, departments, programs, readings. A cult culture that's being fully, you know, made multidimensional and essential. But it's always a struggle. I mean, they're always pushbacks and reactions and, you know, it, the way people say, oh, identity politics now, you know, in this kind of sneery way as if we're all those of us involved with our identities are just a little childish, you know, there are always there are arguments about what books should be in the canon. Um, they, those are always going to keep, those are, those are, I don't know about always, but <laughs> they keep up, they, they stay, you know, it, it's like, oh, is it peaceful demonstration or are they looting, you know? And if they're looting, that discredits everything. You know, those prohibitions, whether they're cultural or political or, or social or sexual, um, sexual gender, keep um, asserting themselves. And then we keep coming back. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad you noticed that line. Um, because one has to admit also the hurt and the damage that, um, that oppression, that exclusion, you know, that everything from condescension to active bigotry, um, the, the toll they take on one, um, they hurt, um, they anger, they wound. Um, so. And that's something we have to be very honest about with ourselves, but also with, with our friends, with our lovers. You know, that it, there used to be, when I was growing up also, one of the things you were supposed to do was always be very 
brave about prejudice or racism, you know. Don't let, don't let the white man think, you know, that, uh, see that you're, he's made you depressed or unhappy. You know, the fact is you could see the legacy. I'm sure many of you can in your own parents. You can see what's wounded, what's hurt. So that's something we, re that's, that's part of, of caring for ourselves and keeping ourselves um, both, you know, vulnerable as well as strong. You know, we, we, we don't all have, we don't always have to be implacable warriors. Um, yeah. Um, Just talk, don't worry, you don't have to raise your hands. <laughs> I was unsure <laughs> how to come back in. Um, I think, It's interesting, this sort of attitude around how you have to comport yourself around your race outside of your That's community. That's well put, yeah. Um, uh, I think I, I, have, I have some questions that, I, it, it, to, it, to pivot a little bit, um, only because I have, I have these family members, of parents, I should say, who are from very different backgrounds. Um, and my, and I, my mother has this sister whom I love, you know, my aunt, she's great, you know, but <laughs> I just remember these terms and my father using them very disparagingly. They say, oh, well, those are Jack and Jill. Oh, and you right. can ask a question about sort of the... Uh, <laughs> Meaning kind of superficial, very snobbish, very ex interested in their own privilege, yeah. You know, certainly my, my grandmother was not pleased when my mother got with my father, but that's neither here nor there, <laughs> you know, it was, I, I think I have a question about the function of certain clubs um, in producing these ideas um, and, and, and replicating them. It was, you said something interesting earlier about um, sort of how these things, these studies, these sort of um, ethnic studies uh, departments were popping up at that time. Uh, but like those things, th those ideas, much like the ideas of like Negro land were, were produced outside of those spaces and then sort of... Exactly, exactly. Uh, Moved into, yeah, right. trans transferred and transplanted by students and by student demands often for departments, right. for programs, for faculty. And so those legacy, those are, the legacy of those departments and, and, and their production of this sort of cultural knowledge and countercultural knowledge is very different than what was being like promoted by the Jack and Jills and the, and the other clubs. And I'm wondering if you could speak to the legacy of that in today's society. You no, know, I wish I knew what was going on with, I mean, I know Jack and Jills still exist, as do sororities, but. I don't know what they're doing. Um, my sense, my experience of it was largely as a social club it's where you, you know, parents get together to be sure that their children meet each other and grow up together. There, were, there was certainly an aspect of certain Jack and Jill chapters, which, which I do write about, I felt I should, um, an aspect of trying to inculcate them with a, with a kind of black pride that had to do with introducing them to Negro, as we would have been called in the 50s, um, writers, musicians, um, you know, even sometimes exposure to, um, if there were Caribbean or African family friends or colleagues, you could expose them to, you know, a little cultural visit and lesson. But that's, you know, that's, that's small. I think most, I think Jack and Jill and most other social clubs, they had names in Chicago like Trees and Twigs, and major and minor, so um, they they were to um, enhance and perpetuate. Um, they were the prelude to what black, white, and other sororities and fraternities are still doing in college, um, which is to encourage a kind of um, satisfaction in 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 sameness, in feeling that you've come together because you have certain privileges and ranks, uh, privileges in, of rank and, and certain rights to pleasure and entertainment. Um, did any, I'm sure a lot of you watched Atlanta, the, the, 
well, they, you know, remember those white fraternity houses? I mean, they were Bastille, but if any, but if you ever saw the Spike Lee's movie about fraternities, the one based at Morehouse, I'm now forgetting its title. It's one of his early films. The fraternities and sororities there were snob factories and mean. Um, so, you know, um, that's, that's with, with good intentions, with sweet whatever is, I think, I, I, I see why your father said that. Um, are they all terrible? No. But as structures, um, you know, they, they perpetuate certain kinds of snobberies and, and desires for certain kinds of privileges and ways of living and a sense of who should be included and who doesn't, who can be excluded. I then have a question around the theater of this tension. Um, you know, like I, I grew up on uh, reruns of the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, which is just oh, God, right. not, like the most exemplary. Here are the uppity heroes, <laughs> and here's this inner city black kid who comes. But he in. was the hero, as I recall, right? Yeah, he was, and it, you know, it was this. But it was in, there's this sort of theater of them learning about how other black people live, and this sort of you know, and uh, this this tension that that it, was that was rife those those tensions, and that show made it kind of comic. Um, but those, particularly with boys who wanted who craved, they they exoticized, um, you know, street blacks often the way white people exoticized them. And but they wanted that they wanted that as part of their legacy, and they often were you know, kind of reckless and arrogant about it and self-destructive. But the theater, the spectacle of that is very interesting because the fact is, you know, you know, if when you read Zora Neale Hurston, she is always chronicling and, and cataloging and dramatizing this, these, oh, all the stylistic vigor of, um, of Black culture, of the culture of what she calls, you know, the man and the woman further down. So we weren't, weren't wrong, you know, to want to be part of that, to understand that we had, we had, we should have access, um, you know, to this cultural richness, which was also dangerous and daring, but which had also produced, you know, things that, that we loved, like jazz and like uh, blues, etc. Um, and yet, because of the social barriers, um, how did we get it? We got it by imitating, we, you know, we got it by, some of the boys, again, got it by becoming drug addicts, so did some of the girls. And, just, and really trying to be street in the most, um, what, almost a, a way of caricature, like assuming that if you were street, you had to be a junkie, or you, you know, you had. So, you know, that's also condescending, as well as self-destructive. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask, how insular were your teenage years in this more upper echelon of like Chicago Black community? Did you interact with um, working class like Black people? And did your parents, I, I, I know there were parts where you talked about having like a white friend and that was kind of also awkward or fraught. <laughs> right, and then you had your own jealousies and like, you know, girls being jealous of each other in school. But also, was there a jealousy of working class Black communities? Did they also, were they curious about the more upper middle class community? Like, what, what was that? There was tension and there was, I would say again, more among boys, but to some extent girls. I think there was a kind of jealousy of, of the stylistic um, risk and flair. You know, these were guys who otherwise were becoming good little you know, middle class, um, whatever. It wasn't so thrilling. Um, I think we girls wanted to be hip, but we were more likely to want to be Diana Ross than Etta James in those days, though we played her records all the time. The interaction, which I've sort of been hedging back from, um, I lived in an all black neighborhood until I was 14, and then it was an integrated neighborhood, and still a lot of the people around us were black, but I interacted with, in terms of interacting on terms of social equality, I interacted with Black people from the same 
world, which was the bourgeoisie. The other interactions were with Black people who were service, you know, who were carpenters or doing, delivering, um, you know, goods or um, running the, the, um, the laundromat down the street. You know, it, that's, that's what the interaction was. Um, the cleaning woman. Um, yeah. So, you know, this was something, this was, again, some of the stuff, some of the material you had to think about hard and look at closely when the late 60s came around um, and you started thinking of yourself as leftist and interested in Marxist ideas. You know, you had to, you had to look back and try to unravel. Um, you know, even though, uh, it's not even though, let us say the, dip, the distance between, and I, I do write about this in one chapter, um, a so-called elite black family and a more working class black family, the distance might be half a block or one house um, on a block, but did you necessarily play together? Or in the incident I write about, the play turned into this kind of um, tension where um, we wanted to play with them because they could do double judge better than us. But then, you know, we were being a little creepy and they made fun of us. And then we went home and got to have our parents avenge, uh, uh, you know, take revenge for us by, you know, dismissing them as, as crude people, as the kinds of black people who, as kinds of Negroes who weren't advancing the race like we were. So there was a lot. Um, thank you, Margaret. I just wanted to ask one quick question. I, I love all the descriptions of hair and, <laughs> and fashion and your books, and you've mentioned so far this, the stylings like, of people in your community. Um, can you talk a little bit about your relationship to clothes and <laughs> to fashion? I love clothes so much. <laughs> uh, but I had to, um, you know, again, this is um, this funny dynamic and tension or um, theater, as um, Memphis said, the theater of, of female style, the, fe the theater of black female style versus or overlapping with or interacting with or segregated from white female style. But within those two styles, you can break down. There are so many, you know, offshoots and breakdowns um, um, and digressions and diversions. Part, when I was growing up in terms of race, there were certain things that you weren't supposed to do, um, you know, like wear overly loud colors. On the other hand, I can remember my mother making fun of friends of hers who were so obsessed with what she called wasp beige. You know, so everything you wore was like tastefully beige. Um, so, you know, we were always walking those, walking those lines, but it was, it was, it, that was interesting. Um, you know, because you, I thought my mother had a wonderful sense of style. I thought she was inventive. I thought she was, you know, not just conventional. I found my father and his friends in that way that I associate with Duke Ellington and, you know, jazz musicians with those pictures. I thought, and they, I thought they were just the epitome of elegance with a certain, you know, kind of, kind of swagger. Um, so I am always interested in what, fashions, what styles are coming up from everywhere around us, not from the sanctioned areas, how they're mm. borrowed, and usually they are borrowed and show up, you know, in high fashion sometime later, but I'm also very interested in um, so-called high fashion. Again, it was so segregated when I was coming along. Now you've got, it's segregated by money, um, you know, but you have got so many. Um, designers claiming they are non-white des um, design, art history, you know, fabric, um, uh, styling, style, um, even just manner. Um, and that's, that's very different. That gives one um, wild range.
Um, I had to get rid of, this is just parenthetical and it's shallow, but being from the Midwest, um, many Midwesterners, um, black and white, um, have this matching thing or used to, you know, it's like, um, <laughs> the, the, this has to be picked up, this color of blue has to be picked up by exactly the same shade in the pants I'm wearing. That's the way it would have been. Um, and maybe I'd have little pearl earrings on that picked <laughs> pick this up perfectly. And yet everything would be color coordinated. I had to work, I still have to work to get rid of that because some part of me that I link with wanting to be a good girl. Um, somehow, you know, we, we display our needs in every aspect of our lives, um, you know, needed that match set thing. Like I had to cover over and decorate the part of me that was going, oh, where am I? <laughs> like my eyes tend to cross. So I've got a cross-eyed psyche, um, but I was covering that up. Um, so I have to, I still have to fight against that. Um, I've never gone back to straightening my hair. Um, I never would, but then I realized, you know, a part of me from the late 60s wants to be snotty about black, black women who straighten their hair. It doesn't matter anymore. As long as, you know, whatever you do, if you feel okay about it. But those were huge, those were huge things for us. And the black, the black female body, you know, the non, the non-white what parts of it you used to be ashamed of. You go to, you go to white department stores and the dresses were too tight because of our butts. <laughs> it could be hard to find. So, you know, you remember, you carry all that in your body and, and you're always looking for ways to, to set it free, to liberate it, or at least to, you know, push at it. But that stuff fascinates me always. It's so funny hearing you talk just because my father grew up in Detroit. He oh, was eight years younger than you. Um, and he, it's just, it's funny, this Midwestern <laughs> Yeah. I mean, Chicago and Detroit are, you know, sister cities, but Detroit is definitely, I mean, I mean this was like Motown Detroit though, so it was yeah. kind of happy, you know. <laughs> so yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't, you know. Sad. Okay. Your lucky father, Motown, Detroit. Yeah. I, can, I can still remember uh, um, Diane Stamps coming back to a party, a uh, basement party, visiting friends in Detroit. And she said, listen to this. It's little Stevie Wonder. Um, some call it pretty music, but the old people call it the blues. And we went, ah! <laughs> Motown was coming. It was so thrilling. Um. I mentioned that just to sort of, uh, we're coming, we're, we're, we're at 5.30, we are at 5.30, um, and I was just wondering if there's something that you would like to leave us with. I think about your stories and your way of storytelling, and I'm thinking, and I'm, only because it, it what you're just, the, the cities that, uh, the cities and, and the things that you were talking about are all cities that I'm familiar with in some way through my family. And so I was wondering if there's something you have to leave us with about the lives that we're living in these paradigms now. Um, I don't know if that may, you know, I, it was just interesting because I think only in the stylistic way that he finishes things, it always ends like that. And I wonder if there's something that you would like to leave us with. You also do that in your book. You, you give us a lot and then there'll be a page, a paragraph that just sort of brings us, and I was wondering if you had something. Well, it seems to me we've been talking a lot, not just me, about it, what's, what stories, like major and minor, um, cataclysmic, but also minutia, are going on around us that are absolutely going to shape us and mark us, whether we want them to or not. Like, we don't want COVID, but we got it. Um, We've got, you know, this huge political movement going on. Um, but what stories inside are, um, are we, are we make, making up about ourselves? Or what stories did we inherit that we just keep getting told, you know, like on automatic pilot, whether we want them or not? And what stories do we, can we keep inventing about um, 
ourselves and putting them in, in the world and finding different ways to, to express them and think about them. Um, so I'm always interested in what really scares me. Um, that's always worth um, wondering about. And it, you know, what, again, how can its role in your story change a bit? Maybe the fear can't disappear. But maybe it can, you know, take place at the scene, <laughs> the mise-en-scene can change, or you can create another part of yourself to, to dialogue with it that's it's different. Um, some sense of, of being able to improvise day by day inside ourselves um, first and then in the world. Thank you. Thank you. You all are so dear. <laughs> and I love the variety. I like this range among you, age and ethnicity, and race, and all sorts of things I'm not even privy to, but I like it. Um, and I have a very mixed world of friends too, and that's very precious to me. That's, that's part of, of what I need to thrive. That's part of the, the narrative, um, the fabric that I need. So, yeah, so Alice and Memphis and Kathleen and Veronica and Perla and Cassandra. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look at her. Oh, her being here with us. <laughs> oh my dears. We'll be we'll be talking again next week for anyone who's still here. And I know that some of the people that uh, were registered for this, there were a lot of people registered for this, and I think they might also be attending for next week because there's multiple meetings of this book. So oh, we would like to have you for the first. I'm very uh, glad to be there. Uh, yeah. If there's something utterly crucial, send me an email and I'll flash back an answer. Okay. Otherwise, thank I you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. By the way, Memphis, I mentioned your name. I, she said to a dear friend of mine, she's, I, I said, oh, we, she said, who runs the book club and I said well her name is Memphis Song Washington and my friend said oh my god <laughs> it's so wonderful that name Full disclosure, my parents are jazz musicians and I, so it's, it's it, yeah <laughs> it had to be yeah yeah and you know also you invite me Memphis Washington invites Margo Jefferson same rhythm <laughs> had to be there <laughs> oh the name is great me but um, all right, I won't keep anyone any further. I just want to say thank you once again. Thank you everyone for coming. We'll be meeting again next Sunday. Same link. You don't have to register again, 4 p.m. Um, thank you, Kaisha. Kaisha just said thank you so much for this conversation. Apologies, my participation could be only be in listening mode. And the Kaisha looks forward to reading the book. Cassandra says thank you so much. This is just from the chat. Great. Wonderful. Wonderful. Oh, fabulous week. Stay cool if you can. And oh, these fireworks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Take care, my dears. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>